yeah, we're live. We can, you can go ahead. <laughs> Hello, my name is Chris. I work for Kingston Libraries. Today, I would like to welcome you to one of our author events. In celebration of Carers Week, we have Rochelle Bug, who will be talking to us about our new book, Handle With Care, My Life as a Young Carer, The Loss of My Parents and How I Learned to Live Again. Now I will pass over to Rochelle, who can tell us a bit about the book and her life as a carer. Um, during the presentation and question and answers, if you've got anything you want to ask yourself, then please write them in the chat and I can to her. Over to you, Rochelle. Hello. Um, yes, well, I mean, it's such a big story, but I'll try and condense it down. I suppose it all starts with one text message that I wrote, help my mum's got cancer. And I wrote that as I stood in the hospital car park one cold Tuesday morning in January. And, you know, there I was, I was 24 years old and I'd just been told that my mum was probably going to die within the next few years. And what made that even more difficult was the fact it wasn't the first time I'd had to deal with news like that. Because when I was 14, my dad had died of pancreatic cancer. So, I mean, I just stood there and I thought, what do you do when your whole world has just fallen apart? I've got two younger sisters at the time. One was 16, she was still at school. The other one had just started her first term at university. And I just thought, what do I do? Who do I turn to? Where do I go to for help? And so I went home that night and I Googled and Googled and Googled, trying to find someone who was talking about what it's like to be a carer like what it's really like all of the things you know like the fact that sometimes you get angry sometimes you want to run away I couldn't really find anything that was talking about the reality of what it's like to be a carer so I was at home for about 18 months in total caring for my mum until she passed away um the nature of her brain tumour meant that pretty quickly she lost the use of the right side of her body. She couldn't see from one of her eyes. And so the care was very intense and I found myself at home a lot of the time. So I started a blog as a way for me to kind of talk through my emotions and try to process stuff in my, ha in my own head. Um, and then yes, yeah, slowly over time, um, I decided to take the blog and turn it into a book, which is what Handle With Care is based on, because I really wanted there to be something for other carers. I wanted there to be something, you know, the thing that I was looking for when I went home and I was Googling. Hopefully that's what this book can be. So as well as giving my story, there are practical tips in there, um, as well as kind of organisations and accounts on social media to follow. So hopefully it's almost like a bit of a companion guide for other carers. Thank you. So how did you get around from transferring from your blog and actually putting it into a book format? Yeah, so when I first got my publishing deal, I think they usually have the opposite problem of authors trying to get up to the word count, whereas I had years of, of blogs, so I had so much content. So for me, it was about trying to think back and think about the key themes. So the book is organised into sections kind of around diagnosis, around family, mental health and self-care, healing and moving on, that kind of thing. So I tended to go through the blog and then group things together and then, then try and weave a consistent story um, within each of those chapters because, you know, I know what it's like to be a carer. You're juggling 101 things at any given moment. And I know that back then I didn't necessarily have the time to read a whole book from start to finish. So it's quite important for me to have those distinct sections so that yeah. if you're particularly struggling with, you know, changing family dynamics, you can dip into the family chapter and be like, oh, thank goodness it's not just me. <laughs> do you know what yes. I mean? And do it like that. Yes. No, I think it was laid out very well. How long did it take you to get it from the blog to the mm -hmm. how long was that sort of in process um it was a very off and on process so I 
started to get it together um, before I had a publishing deal. But then once I had the deal, I so I got it just at the start of the pandemic. So it's kind of a focused, um, what was it? So I started in about March time. And then the final draft, I think, was handed in July, August time. So, um, yeah, in a strange way, the pandemic probably helped focus me on writing because there weren't any other distractions. Yes. Cool. Um, you mentioned as well that you spent some time out in Bali because after mm -hmm. your mum passed, you started a new job and quickly you realised that that wasn't working. So you took some yeah. time out and went to Bali. How long was mm. you in Bali and what did you do then when you come home and did it help? Yes, so I think after my mum died, I I guess I felt so helpless, like I didn't know what to do and I kept searching for an answer and, you know, you name it, I tried it. I went to see psychics, I went to juicing retreats in Spain and I was kind of looking outside for something to fix how I was feeling inside and give me a path forward. Um, and then I, like you said, had a job. But I thought, hang on a minute, I know that I haven't quite dealt with everything that's coming up. So I went over to Bali by myself for a month in total. And really for me, you know, I had vague plans. I was like, I know I want to visit here, here, here. But I was trying to, I think it's such a big temptation when you're grieving just to keep busy and keep pushing those feelings down and think, you know, it's okay, just keep going forward, keep going forward. But I think I've found if you do that at some point, they catch up with you. So that month for me, I suppose, was time to just breathe and be honest with myself and start writing and start reflecting. That was when I started looking back at the blog and I think it was helpful for me to go back and to read through what did actually happen um because I think you forget bits or you minimize and you tell yourself oh, it wasn't that bad just get over it but so yeah in Bali I started reading through the blog and almost letting it sink in and then thinking oh wow I've, I've managed to get through that so far so yeah so what what job are you doing now I'm a copywriter, so I'm a contractor as well. I think that's something that's come from my experience as a carer and losing both my parents so young. I really value having that independence and that freedom to set my own hours and to work for myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and that came as a direct result of the blog, like starting to get into writing and doing it professionally. Um, but yeah, I really, really enjoy it. Would you consider writing another book? Because from reading it, you've got a really natural flair for writing. Have you thought about writing anything else? Yes, I'd love to. Um, I think whether it's specifically related, I've got a few ideas kind of mulling over in my head about more practical solutions for dealing with grief and how to work through that and maybe sharing more of, you know, a lot of stories tend to end, you know, when you lose someone but it's almost like well how do you then you know what happens next you know the Hollywood version of events is they get the terminal diagnosis you see a couple of shots in the waiting room in the hospital a funeral a few tears and then it's almost back to normal whereas my experience has been the complete opposite of that so um yeah definitely I'd love the opportunity to write about you know, share my stories of how I've tried to move forward and look at other ways and how other cultures deal with it. Cool. Um, sorry, my colleague said a bit about um, also that you found the definition about carers from the NHS lacking. If you could expand on that a little bit more. Yeah, I think carer is a term and I know I've spoken to lots of other carers and when someone says are you a carer very often you go well no I'm I'm just a daughter or I'm just a son or I'm just a wife and you almost don't you don't think to give yourself that title and for me and I know for a lot of other people the term being a carer at first I thought oh isn't that someone who works in a care home or is you know, has some kind of qualification or is in social care. 
and so for a long time I didn't call myself a carer it was through hospital appointments and GP appointments with my mum I slowly realized oh okay what I'm doing is being a carer um but even still the technical definition for me what is involved in being a carer is so vast you know from organizing appointments chasing I think that was one of the big things for me I did not realize how much admin was involved in being a carer as well as the more practical side of things of giving medication and getting people you know washed and dressed and that kind of a thing but also you're an emotional support you're the point of contact for friends and family you have to deal with their emotions when you tell them bad news you perhaps need to go and speak with lawyers sort power of attorney you need to suddenly understand about that person's finances which you may not have needed to do before and you know there's so many levels to it and with my mum's brain tumor it kind of changed her personality as well and she'd forever be saying things that she probably wouldn't have done if she was well to people so you'd find yourself apologizing to them like oh no she didn't mean it like that I'm sorry and so yeah I think the technical definition of a carer is obviously useful it serves its purpose but I think when you're in it yourself the sheer scale and scope of all the tasks that you have to take on you know you'd be there if it was a job description it would be kind of 10 pages long for everything that you that you need to do and take on mm. the thing I think that I found really useful as well is because you're saying you partly wrote the book because there wasn't the information out there for carers but I actually found it really useful as learning about the life of him I didn't realize some of the things and I found that really insightful and I got to a carers and it just made me understand things a little bit more and my mum is a carer to my nan who's got um, dementia as well and just a lot of stuff made me think oh you know what it is people really need and if it works for one person doesn't yeah. necessarily work for another so I think it's definitely given me a lot more enlightenment into it and perhaps a bit more understanding and bit, perhaps a bit more I'll be a bit more careful what I say and do yeah and I think that's definitely something that was really important for me because at certain points when I was a carer I thought oh I wish people wouldn't say that or but you know they mean well and you know they're trying yeah. their best but to a certain ex extent it's not until you've been through it or had someone explain it to you in great detail that then you might say oh of course I like it's a silly thing to say you know one of the ones big ones for me was when people would say oh just think positive and I knew they meant well I knew they were trying you know in their head they were thinking oh I don't want to bring you down but to me I thought well what do you think if I I'm not being positive enough and that's why my mum's dying if I was more positive that she'd be okay mm. or you know sometimes I was trying to be positive but for me you know if you were trapped in a massive thunderstorm absolutely drenched rain hammering down and you said oh my goodness like I'm absolutely soaked I wouldn't say to you that's so ungrateful your, your armpits dry why are you not grateful for that? And that's what it kind of felt like for me when people said, just think positive. I was like, well, I am thinking positively, but the facts are, it's a terminal diagnosis. You know, this, this is what we're dealing with. So you have to kind of balance. Yes, I can be grateful that I'm able to care for my mum. I can be grateful that, you know, we've got this last bit of time together, but the two can coexist. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't also say that you're struggling or you're finding things difficult. Mm, no, it definitely made me have food for thought on <laughs> practical and, you know, think about it a bit more. Also, I was wondering, do you think your book would itself to be dramatised on the telly? Because I think it's a, a topic that's not really talked about. So, you know, I wonder if... Oh, I love that you say that. That's what I've been secretly hoping and wishing yeah. and praying for, because like you said, 
it's about raising awareness because the t statistics show you know one I think it's one in eight people I think it might be one in seven and with the pandemic that's gone up to even more how many people are going to be carers whether it's for an elderly parent you know yep. a child a spouse at some point we are all going to have to experience a loved one being ill needing help needing care and so it just blows my mind that it isn't something that's spoken about. And I think because it isn't spoken about, when it happens to you, you then keep quiet, A, because you're so busy, and B, because you think, oh, well, no one else is talking about this, so I'm going to come across that I'm complaining about something that everyone else just gets on with. And I think, hopefully, you know, if it were to be you know, turned into something for TV or film, that would be great. Like you said for yourself once you get that insight into what day-to-day yeah. -day life is like it completely flips on its head because I think if you if you say to just any random person with no experience what does a carer do it'd be like um give medication and actually if you write out what a carer does you know I was sleeping with a baby monitor in my room so that if my mum yep. needed the toilet in the night I got up to take her I'd have to shower with the door open so I could hear her yep. if she fell or anything like that happened I would yes give her her medication but I'd have to check because you know I knew that some tablets she didn't like so she'd hide them under her tongue she'd hide them in her pillow she'd you know do all of these things and there are just so many skills that you have to develop as a carer I think are just so by and large in general they're not valued and they're not recognized and it shouldn't be you know oh you've had to be a carer for two years you had a bit of time out it's like no those people who are carers within the workforce are absolute superhumans the time management the organization the negotiation skills you know everything that carers have to do in their day-to-day -day life and don't give a second thought they're so like such amazing skills and are so then valuable in employment and just in general you mentioned a little bit as well earlier about the impact of covid mm. um as well because as you say you know your time was pre all that and you were already getting things where you wait to scans and you hadn't had the scans and you went to the results and they were like, oh, well, you've come for the results, but you're going to have to go away because you haven't got the scan. And yeah, a point you miss for ages. I just wonder, you know, how much work that's going to be now in COVID times, because there's going to be loads of people that haven't had all those appointments during yeah. this period and how many people have actually got worse but don't want to come forward is there yeah. any sort of tips you could give people or things that you think could be done I think the biggest one for me would be to validate how those people are feeling because I know outside of Covid how much I had to push how much I had to persist how much I you know had to keep chasing so don't feel if you've got a gut instinct that something isn't right or you're not being listened to, stick with that and don't feel, you know, oh, I'm being a pain. Oh, I shouldn't complain too much. You know, make sure if you know something's not right and something's not adding up, you do have to keep pushing. And that's not you being annoying. That's because, you know, the system, particularly now with the effects of COVID and waiting lists and all of that, unfortunately it really isn't up to what's needed so it does fall back on you as carers as the patient to have to kind of fight to get what you need so I would say to people you know be gentle on yourself and do what you need to do to keep yourself charged up and afloat so that you've got the fight in you to keep pushing for for what you need Yes, I found it very interesting as well in your book that you say you know, what works for one doesn't work for another. And, you know, there was loads of things you tried, um, yeah. you know, you relaxation hour and various different things. And it's just eventually finding what worked for you. 
yeah, I think that was one of the big learning curves for me, because I think a lot of the mental health advice you see on Instagram, for example, is, you know, have a long bath with a scented candle or, you know, go for a walk and listen to a podcast. And all of those things are great. But I think as a carer, you need to remember you're not dealing with, you know, average everyday stresses. You're going through a very, very intense period. And so because of that, almost like the tools you need to keep afloat need to be a bit more robust and a bit more serious. And I think take the pressure off because I you know, it made me feel like I was a bit of a failure, really, because I was thinking, oh, well, everyone else is saying, you know, they do couch to 5k and have a green smoothie, and they're feeling great. So why don't I feel great? There must be something wrong with me. I'm not trying hard enough to feel happy. And now I'd say to carers, you know, you're never going to feel normal. It's an abnormal situation. So give yourself a break just try to find little things that give you enough to keep on going you're never going to feel on top of the world joyful that you know in my case your mum's dying you're never going to be like whoa this is amazing I can't wait you know you need to understand that those those things and mental health strategies aren't there to make you feel really happy but they will give you enough you know think of it like your mobile phone you have to charge it in each day for it to keep going and that's what those things are and you know just be feel free to experiment see what works for you I know what worked for me one week one week I would find it really useful to go for long walks by myself the next week I wouldn't because I'd feel too anxious about leaving my mum so you know the next week it would be more about I don't know having music on in the background that reminded me of holidays or something you really have to allow yourself that the mental health support you're using is it's okay to change over time mm. I think as well it sort of brings back memories a little bit for me of the experience of caring for someone a bit like when he was doing homeschooling yeah. because that, that time where everyone was you know what you should be doing and you're like actually do you want to beat yourself up that you haven't sat there and some of the mums you know will produce these great elaborate pieces <laughs> you know we've just managed to do one sum today <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah you know what we've achieved the sum today that's better than no sums absolutely absolutely and I think exactly what you say it's recognizing what a crazy whirlwind you're living in and just being like oh okay normal standards don't count for now I just need to do as much as I can and that's more than enough yes and I think sometimes you get these expectations of what you should be doing but actually unrealistic you know this person yeah. who's doing these great elaborate things is that yeah. actually the only person and the rest of the world is actually tearing their hair out just like yeah and that's definitely what I found I used to call it like the Hollywood way of coping because that was all I'd ever really seen on screen you know the films like yeah. Stepmom with Julia Roberts and they're there making a you know a perfect patchwork quilt and amazing photo book memories and having you know picture perfect Christmases and everything's recorded in an artistic way on a video camera and I think I felt the pressure I'd try and do things like that <laughs> you know and then I'd look and I'd be like it's half three in the afternoon I'm still in my pajamas my hair has been in a greasy bun on the top of my head for the past two weeks because I haven't had a chance to wash it but do you know what mum's happy she's not in pain she's had her medication today I've made food that's you know that's enough that's good enough and not expecting myself to be the person whose mum is diagnosed and then they're off you know trekking the Himalayas and climbing Everest and doing this that and the other that's great if you're one of those people but that wasn't me that's probably never going to be me um and so yeah not having that pressure to always turn a negative into a positive and like you say that was kind of 
similar with lockdown and the pandemic you know that pressure at first what hobby are you going to learn what are you going to do with your free time and sometimes you know if you do end up doing that that's great but don't put that expectation on yourself it was quite ironic we made salt dough creations out of our hand prints and then about six months ago, whoa <laughs> amazing <laughs> <laughs> well I want to say thank you ever so much for coming it's great that you've done this book and just giving insight as I say and help not only to the carers themselves but also to other people in the understanding have you found that you've had a lot of people contact you since uh, but published I know it's only been yes. published recently yes it's been way more than I expected and I think because as a carer so often when you become the voice for someone else, you tend to lose your own. And so when the opportunity comes up, when you see someone else that's been through what you have, you know, whenever I speak to another carer, there's this instant, blah, 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 because you're like, oh my goodness, did you do this? Oh, you did this. Oh, me too. Oh, did you do it? Yep, 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 yep. And so it's almost, I think so many people have got in touch because they think finally, oh, there's someone talking about it that gets it, which, you know, has been, amazing but yet also really saddening and really heartbreaking that there are so many people out there feeling like they're going through it alone and that there isn't anyone that understands when actually you know there are millions of us doing the same thing by ourselves yes very helpful is there anything else you want to say to our viewers before we go or any other things? No, just any of you that are a carer or just struggling in general, just I think the big message from the book for me is that there were so many points along the way that I didn't think I could keep going or I didn't understand how I could keep going because everything felt like too much. So just to say, literally just keep, not even one day at a time, take it 10 seconds at a time and just keep getting through 10 seconds then another 10 seconds and you know you'll get there well thank you ever so much for joining us and having settled down again you can perhaps come and um, see us in person yes definitely sounds good to me oh someone that's actually sorry just come up with a question mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Um, what is the best way to support a carer in looking after himself or herself? Yeah, I think one big thing, so simple things like when you text them, for example, put at the end, no need to respond. That one was a huge one for me because I felt like I was juggling so many things. And sometimes it was lovely people were getting in touch, but it felt like yet another chore. And I felt guilty that I wasn't getting back to them also being proactive with suggestions so a lot of people would say to me oh let me know if there's anything that I can do to help which is great but then you think oh I don't know did they really mean it or were they just saying it and then oh you know it felt like yet something else I had to think of almost like you know training someone at work and talk them through so what I would always say to people was really helpful were the people that would say to me um okay what's best Tuesday afternoon or Thursday evening um I've ordered some online shopping bits for you they'll be delivered not oh what do you need oh when's good oh let me know just so almost being proactive so say yeah. I'll come around on Saturday morning leave your ironing in a pile by the door I'll grab it be in and out in two minutes and I'll drop it back on Monday so you you, you know give them an opportunity to say no but go with a proactive suggestion for them to say yes or no with because they might say oh do you know what I'm fine I'm caught up on the ironing but what I could really use help with is if you pop to the chemist to pick this prescription up because I haven't had a chance but yeah for yeah. me phrasing it like that and just taking the expectation off of them by saying you know no need to reply don't worry about getting back to me just the really simple things like that that effectively just give them one less thing to think about but yeah I hope that helps Thank you. No worries. Just seeing if there's any more things coming out. Okay. 
Well, thank you okay. once again. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>